From Cali to Tally, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source, and this is Wake Up Warchant. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! It's Wake Up Warchant, everybody. That's that's how you know it's happening, because I just yell at you, wake up! I'm Aslan. Corey's here as well. Follow the show. Wake Up War Channel on Twitter. Follow Corey. Corey underscore Clark. Corey with an E. Clark without the E. Um, my life better with you here, I guess. Wow, that got really awkward. Let's make it a better show than how I've started off so far. Corey, how are you? I'm good, buddy. Uh, my life is always better when you're in it, yeah. when when we're talking. those that Obviously, the highlight of my day and the highlight of my week. Don't quite believe you, but we'll roll with it for, uh, for the time being. We're going to do a... Uh, a nice, robust, healthy version of the Renegade Express, uh, answering all your questions, our subscribers on the Tribal Council. If you're not a subscriber, it's never too late to join. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 to get a feel for things. You know, hang out for 30 days. It's like uh, couch surfing, crashing on your buddy's sofa. You get 30 days of it, though, and it's nowhere near as awkward. And uh, if you're not happy, which I don't suspect you, you would not be happy, you can leave. It'll be fine. But then you can just hang out. It'll be like we've added an addition to the house, and you have your own room, and you can hang out and uh, talk to Corey and I and Michael Langston and Gene Williams and maybe even myself. I like it, Corey. What do you think? What? I don't know. Whatever. Um, all right, so Kendall Browse, he, he signed a contract, obviously, because he's Florida State's offensive coordinator now. Mm-hmm. He's also the associate head coach. What other things, um, after you poured through that 13-page contract, Corey, did you walk away uh, from thinking about uh, the the contract, the the stability, uh, the ins, the outs, uh, would have you signed it if you were Kendall Browse? I believe I would have. I believe I would have had a hard time not signing any contract that guarantees me three million dollars. I mean, I know we're in different lines of work, but still, that's got to be fun. Plus, you get the six fifty dollar, uh, six hundred fifty dollar a month uh, vehicle uh, expense, which is nice. You could probably Huge. have a nice lease for that kind of money, right? Huge. I don't lease cars; I just buy them. In cash, straight cash. But I understand that six fifty a month would get you a pretty nice car, right? Uh huh. Yeah. And a twenty thousand dollar moving stipend. Yeah. Which you know, if you only use like nine thousand dollars of that money, Aslan, you can pocket the rest. Now we wouldn't advocate doing something like that. Of course not. Of course not. You would probably want to give that back to the university or uh, charity or something. Yeah. So yeah, there it is, folks. A three year deal. Uh, the way it's structured is that I guess you know this since the university is a state university, they're capped at the amount of money they can spend uh, in terms of athletic expenditure. So he gets two hundred thousand dollars from the university sort of uh, coffer, and then the boosters make up the remaining eight hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, one million dollars a year, three year deal. He does have the. Fl- I'll be honest, man. Uh, when I the first thing I saw when I when, I, when the, well, the first thing I went and looked for when I saw the contract was. Dollar signs. I, I just scrolled through. I just want to see the 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 amount of compensation he was going to get. Uh, I think a million's like a a bargain. Um, I mean, who knows if it's going to work out? I, I feel like it will. It's just it's it's worked out too long in too many different places for it to not work here at Florida State for him. That I mean, to get him for a million. I mean, I think Harlan Barnett. What do we pay him? Nine fifty. Nine hundred. Nine eighty. Nine eighty. I think. Yeah. I mean, shoot. You get Kendall Browse for that for for only, and I, I kind of use that kind of tongue in cheek. Only one million. That's a um, well. Uh, I would say this though, like Harlan Barnett's resume when he got to Florida State was more as well. Let me put this way: as impressive as Kendall Bryles. I mean, Michigan State's defenses have been really good for a decade now, and he had a big hand in that. And also, the one thing you could say about Kendall Bryles is, you know, sure he was the OC, but he was the OC for Major Applewhite. He was the OC for Lane Kiffin, and he was the OC for his dad. So he was the OC for guys that kind of had their own offenses and knew how to run it anyway. You know what I mean? Well, um, Lane Kiffin has said as much. That Lane Kiffin said that he was hands off and that he let Kendall do what he had to do. Sure, I'm not. No, I'm not disputing that Kendall Bryles wasn't a good hire, or that he didn't uh, have a lot to do with the successes of those offenses. I'm just saying that you know, doing it at FIU. In F-A-U. Houston for a year. FAU. Get it right, man. Yeah. Owls. Golly, I always say FIU. I mean, you know, one of them. One of them, folks. I know one's the Owls. Ooh. Deal with it. Um, and then, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think when you look at Harlan Barnett, what he did at a bigger school for a lot longer, you would say ha- had is he, I would have more uh, a more impressive resume. I don't agree with that. Um, well, you're crazy. 
I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know how Pat else to say. Only because how much – it's not like he came in and installed – I guess D'Antonio, D'Antonio had a, he has his hands on that defense too, right? He's a defensive minded guy. Yeah, D'Antonio. So you can make, you can make the same argument there. I, I would say that Bryles has done, or, or Barnett did it longer in, against better competition. I mean, well, that Michigan State made the playoff. They did in his first season, actually. His first season as their DC um, or associate or co DC or what have you, uh, they made the playoff. But yeah, Narduzzi was there for a lot of that sort of burn that they had at Michigan State. And then before that, uh, you know, Barnett was a position coach. but uh, And he was yep. a co-DC. Uh, but but e- either either Good way, I guess the point is that the resumes aren't that different. I don't think Bryles is a guy that has proven yet that he's a one-and-a-half or $2 million assistant coach. Corey, now, if he has a good year next year, he will. Corey, he's coordinated, like, top ten offenses the last four years in a row and, and in different places. I, I don't know, man. I'm just uh, – I put more value into Browse's um, resume than Harlan Barnett, but some people might think that's because I have latent racism inside of me, but I don't agree with that. Um, I just think Well, that, I, uh, no comment on that. Yeah. Uh, no by the way, Monday would have been a great time to do a show and finally go on my uh, civil rights and uh, my manifesto on race, but, you know. Sure, you know, sure. Well, it, yeah, especially, but then we got the tweet, and right. then that, that took, that took uh, precedent, obviously. Yeah, yeah, so. But yeah, I mean, back to the point though. I, I think one million is a bargain, but part of it is that Bryles uh, probably, you know, it's it's a give and take. Obviously, when you're doing these contracts, it seems like he probably gave up more compensation to get the flexibility that it is a three year contract, but he can leave after two seasons uh, if he gets a head coaching job in the college uh, arena, or if he gets any sort of job in the NFL or, or professional football. So I guess he could even leave for a CFL job but I don't see him leaving the Florida State to be a CFL guy. But if, if he leaves after two seasons for a head coaching job in the college or an NFL job in any sort of uh, you know manner or role, uh, there's no penalty for him. But if, but if he leaves... I also can't imagine that's rare. I mean, I just can't imagine what buyouts are like for assistant coaches. I mean, again, I'm, I don't know. I only follow Florida State, really. I don't delve into other teams' contracts. Right. But even if he had a buyout, what would you think the buyout would be? A couple hundred thousand? 500, I mean, it's not, it, you know, I, know, I saw people on Twitter reacting like the way Twitter reacts at stuff like that. And it's like, man, you're not, the, the reason for a buyout should be number one, to get compensated and also to be a, uh, you know, I don't know, not, not a scare tactic, but you want it to, you want him to have to really think about it or the school that's hiring away from you to have to really pay the price. Well, you know, like, oh God, we're gonna have to pay that $7 million buyout. All right, I guess we'll do it. Man, nobody's gonna blink about a five hundred thousand dollar buyout. Yeah, it's just not. You can't with assistant coaches. You can't have buyouts that lock them in. That's not feasible. It's not realistic. No, no university does it. Except maybe I. I don't even know what Venable's buyout is. But he's the only one in the country that I would think would have a that I would that I'd be willing to put like a multi multi million dollar buyout clause in. Right. Well, um, in, in either case, I mean, I still think. Again, I just think that that's a bargain, man. I mean, to get him for a million dollars a year, I, I don't like the fact that I'm having to use the word million and bargain in the same sentence. But unfortunately, that's the reality of the of what we live in right now with college football and where Florida State was after a disastrous 2018 season. So uh, you got to pony up, and uh, that's, that's the where- and again, that's the lure of Florida State, right? And by the way, number one, you're paying two million dollars a year for your coordinators. That's not chump change. That's top 15 in the country top 10 to 15 in the country. So you're still competitive financially. Um, and and they're not done making hires. So by the time the dust settles, again, I think they'll be in the top 10, top 12 in the country in assistant coaching salaries. Um, but also, it's also the allure of Florida State. Like, I, again, Bryles looks at this job, as he should, as a stepping stone to a head coaching spot at a major university. That's what people – I know the last guy just went to UMass. I think the last guy, it could have been like, hey, we're – there might have been a hand on his back like hey why don't we bounce well there's a cool job up in Amherst man why don't you go look at that um I I do think that Bryles if he succeeds at Florida State will have his pick of uh jobs around the country or an NFL guy I mean look man um what's his name just got hired uh, from Texas Tech he was fired at Texas Tech and now he's the uh, head coach in the NFL so if he really does well at Florida State he could be an NFL commodity yeah yeah for sure for sure so 
Uh, there you have it. And Cliff Kingsbury, by the way, that's the uh, the guy who left Texas Tech or was told to leave. Uh, what's his Tech. name? That's what. But again, don't you think that that's what Bryles looks at at Florida State? No. Like, yeah, he probably could have made more money somewhere else. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. But uh, I don't think he's like, ah, oh, man, I'd rather have one point four. I think he's like, okay, yeah, I'll take $3 million, and I'm going to get to coach these guys at Florida State, a big-time program. I'm going to average 38 points a game next year, and then I can go anywhere I want. Oh, for sure. For sure, yeah. Um, again, it's it's the give and take, I think. Um, I mean, I'm not his agent, uh, Rick Smith of Priority Sports, but I uh, feel like they left some money on the table. But, hey, that, that's good for Florida State. Although Florida State does absorb uh, his buyout with Houston, it is $900,000. Uh, one of the things, that, too, though, is that like, say Bryles does leave for the NFL, say he gets a head coaching job at, I don't know, Texas Tech, let's say, in two years or whatever, and he, he doesn't get penalized, obviously, because he's leaving for a head coaching job. He does have to absorb the remaining uh, the, the remaining balance of the buyout that Florida State's paying out for him. So um, yeah, there, there's some probably, things. I mean, I, I don't even I guess they'd be 300000 a year that they, they, they'd pay Houston. But again, that's what I'm saying. Like, And that's a pretty hefty buyout. Quite frankly, oh. nine hundred thousand for Houston, but he had just signed that contract, um, and they were trying to make it. Um, I don't know. They were trying to hold on to the guy, so they wanted to make it worth their while. So they put a big number there for an assistant coach. Did it matter to Florida State at all? No. You, you just there's not a buyout big enough that you can realistically put out there that would keep teams or in a, certainly NFL teams from uh, fr- from coming and hiring a guy that they want. So uh, stay anyway. uh, connected to Warchant.com, folks. I'm sure as more details come out, uh, Corey and I are not the uh, the legal department for Warchant.com. Um, I wasn't able to pour into the contract as much as I, I would have liked before coming onto the show, but also I did the recruiting chat with Michael Langson, so uh, Wednesdays uh, were a little bit busy for me there. But anyhow, uh, Corey, uh, you ready to hop on some ponies, answer some questions? We don't hop on the ponies, do we? I thought they just came and delivered the mail. Oh, okay. All right. That works as well. But I hear them. Do I hear them in the distance? Is that oh, them coming around the yeah. track? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, good. All, All right. right. Sweet. Let's go. Uh, J.I.I. Knowles. Wake up. It's Jeremy again from Miami, which is the hometown of American Idol winner David Archuleta. Trying okay. to avoid the obvious ones. Uh, right. Be- being that we were behind in the strength and conditioning department when Willie got here, do you think this is the off season where he can get back to where we need to be in that department? Uh, Aslan, once again, great hanging out with you in Chicago. Corey, thanks for being brutally honest each and every day because I wouldn't want to hear you any other way. Go Knowles! Oh, there we go. That's all. I, that's all I can be. You know what I mean, Aslan? That's all I can be. It's brutally, somebody brutally in honest. the uh, somebody in the recruiting chat was saying, uh, Aslan, love uh, wake up war chant. Tell Corey to stop being so negative. And I was like, no, 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 no. Uh, that's me. I'm the negative one. He's the cheery one. And they're like, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. I'm kind of the uh, yeah. the Homer guy. Yeah. Um, anyhow, all right. Can they make it up uh, in another off season here in strength and conditioning? Boy, you, you I'm like not to smart so. enough to know no. how to build bodies and how long it takes to change the way of the fabric of a team and how guys get in shape and how bigger they are and how much stronger they are, like what's the normal uh, rate or time frame, but you would hope. I mean, you're paying that guy a lot of money. Um, You would hope you would see strides and dividends and people getting bigger, faster, and stronger. Yeah, I mean... That's kind of the plan when they get to college, right? Right. I think it's fair to start expecting visible aesthetic difference. I mean, who knows if it's going to pay off, but you, you sure would like to see some guys make some transformations. Now I know, uh, you know, people gave me, uh, you know, a grief about, you know, f- you know, 15 spring practices and, uh, you know, a week and a half at IMG and, uh, your, your preseason camp's not enough to get everything installed and change everything that you want to change. But man, um, uh, this, it's a full year now. And then you'll have, you know, it'll be 18 months, 19 months. Yeah, it'll be like 20 months by the time uh, the season starts. So obviously, again, I don't know enough. It took me a long time to craft the body that I currently have. I mean, there's a lot of molding that goes on. It's a lot of hard work day in and day out just for sometimes minimal strides. Right. But so, you know what I'm saying? So I understand. But that's just my body. I would think 20 months of hardcore conditioning every day. I would think that would uh, uh that would lend itself to uh seeing some results. You you would hope. Yeah, I mean a lot of it obviously is nutrition as well. I mean I, I just think the we should just try to I should try to reach out to maybe like Kendall Smith uh with the cow I think he's with the Cowboys. Last I checked, he's with the Cowboys. 
because I don't. I feel like that realm of like strength coaching and stuff. You, people aren't necessarily getting guys who study kinesiology or were, you know, setting up periodization training for Olympians and stuff to come be their strength coach at a university. Usually, it's just some sort of guy who played football somewhere who has a couple, you know, started as, you know, was was the softball strength coach, and then he moved up to the basketball strength coach, and then after six years, he's now the football strength head coach. And, you know, you're obviously learning stuff on the fly, but that, there's so many different ways to, uh, you know, put together regiments for football. I mean, there's no one singular way that you're going to get these guys where they need to go. Um, but I do wonder um, if Florida State has, like, the, the right sort of mix of guys that, that, that can – uh, get these guys uh, looking, performing the, the way they need to. So, um, or also you can just go recruit a lot more like Derwin James type guys. I don't know that a strength helped. coach had anything to do with Derwin James. Yeah, just go Timmy, recruit those kind of guys. Yeah, Timmy Jordan or Dalvin too. Cooks. Yeah, those guys are good. Hey, by um, the way, all right. So I, I mentioned it yesterday. I want to get it out of the way so I can stop uh, uh, keeping my phone open. Uh, but this is Shanna's question for the Renegade Express. Are you ready? Shanna Clark in uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia. No, well, now it's Shanna Botton Gino, maybe. No. Botton, it's a, it's a, it's a w- w- little weird last name. It'll always um, be Shanna Clark to me. Right. Well, me too. Um, so anyway, uh, she texted and asked a question. Uh, first off, she said, "You say quite frankly an ordinate amount on your show with a smiley, with a little winky face." Erroneous. I, you know, again, I, yeah, we, I almost shouldn't even keep reading here. Um, I want you guys to explain. This is for you, Aslan. It's a question for you. I'm leaving it for you. I want you guys to explain to those of us who have never watched Baylor what to expect this offense to look like. Compare and contrast with Jimbo's and Willie's. And will it work with a quarterback who doesn't move very well and holds on to the ball too long because it seems like that kid will never leave? Never in all caps. Oh. That's my Renegade Express question because she's not joining War Chant presently because she says she doesn't have any money. But so... <laughs> Anyway, so it's your ex-wife. She's not a member, and she criticized you at the top of the question. Now I'm supposed to sit here and answer it. Well, she's been, you know, she's been good to the Clark family for a while. She did produce Brady Clark, okay. who calls you his godfather. Right. Okay. Um. So she does have that uh, working for. Her. So just for that reason alone, we should answer this question and then never again. I mean, I haven't watched a lot of Baylor football. I mean, I, I, there you go. Next question. <laughs> I mean. I would think in terms of like formations, it's not going to look that much different than, than honestly what Willie and, and Walt Bell did last year. I think a lot of what Willie has tried to do, and, and maybe he had done at USF and Oregon, was derivative of, of Art Bryles and Kendall Bryles. I mean, they're still going to be predominantly shotgun. They're going to be one back. I mean, I think when you, you see things about Nasir Upshur going into the portal, uh, a guy who's immensely talented, I think you know he sees the writing on the wall. This, it's not going to be an offense that's going to play – two tights and, and do, uh, you know, 12 personnel, things like that, where you have one back, two tight ends. They're, they're just not going to do that. Um, but, I mean, I don't know if – I don't think they are as dependent on perimeter pass. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Again, I haven't seen as much from them. But I just know, like, watching Ole Miss, I feel like, you know, when Hugh Freeze was there, a lot of a lot of that sort of high school hybrid stuff that, that is permeated into college, you know, like guys like Art Bryles and, and Gus Malzahn, kind of authored and, and guys like obviously uh, Kendall Browse is his son and Hugh Freeze um, coached in uh, in the state of Arkansas and also has familiarity coaching in high school. So I think a lot of what they, they, they try to do is the same, but I don't think, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know how many guys are going to eat when it comes to running the ball. I do think there it's more of like a hot hand sort of offense. I think they'll probably try to identify one of these backs and let him run the whole darn time, which I think will probably be a guy like Cam because Cam's so good in pass protection as well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing, I don't think, uh, innovative that we're, we haven't seen before. Actually, I'll take that last 10 seconds back. This is me saying I really don't know, but uh, it's going to look good. How about that? That's all. That You know what? That's all we need. I do think just from watching Baylor in years past, I've always thought they – they do throw the ball a little bit more than Willie would like to. And I think they will find one or two guys and just hammer them with throws. Like, you know, that I think they had a, they had a Blitnikoff winner one year. I mean, they'll, they have one or two receivers that always put up huge numbers. It seems like. Yeah. Corey Coleman. Hey man, speak up. Your, uh, your microphone is like, for, put your microphone closer to your How mouth. Now? Better. Any better? Okay. Better. Good. Yeah. So they had a guy last year. Houston had a guy last year that had 75 catches. 
for a uh, thousand yards and nine touchdowns, and then 40, 35, 33, 30. Yeah, so I, I think that's what you're looking at. It's obviously Tamorian Terry. You look at him to have about 81 catches for I don't know 1,900 yards. Sounds good. Somewhere in there, 22, 23 touchdowns, and then everybody else will you know they'll eat after him. Mm-hmm. Daddy's gonna get the big piece of chicken. Everybody else eats after Tamorian Terry. I'll make a uh, not so bold prediction. I'm going to say Trey Sean Harrison will be the second leading receiver. Okay, that is a bold prediction. That's what I'll say. That's what I'll say. Hot takes. All right. Addition on hot takes. Honey fried pickings. Top of the morn to you, gents. Really pulling for Willie Taggart, and I'm curious to know what you would consider to be a quote successful season next year. I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, home of Desmond Doss, the World War II hero and Medal of Honor recipient the movie Hacksaw Ridge was based on. Lynchburg also home to Liberty University, developed by the infamous Reverend Jerry Falwell and new home of Hugh Freeze. Thank you. All right. Okay. Successful season. You go first, Corey. What's a successful season for Florida State football in 2019? Nine wins. Don't care who they're against. Get to nine wins. You can lose to both your rivals. That's not... Uh, that's not ideal. You don't want to, but if you lose to both your rivals in Clemson and win all the other games, that's a successful season. Like nine. By the way, I just looked it up. So at FIU, sorry, FAU in 2017, they did have a guy, Devin Singletary, that ran for 1,900 yards. Yes. He had always. 300, 301 carries. Yeah. So they must go. I mean, I do think another thing that they do. They go um, fast. And again, this this goes back from to watching Baylor. I, I did not watch a second of Houston or, or FAU football the last two years. Um, I probably should get on YouTube and maybe check out some of that. Um, Baylor goes faster, I think. Like, so I think you know, you know a lot of those runs that Singletary had probably were like 33 on the clock where they just lined up, got ready, and went. Um, and I would think – so that's – I would think that might be a difference too, maybe, is that they'll go a little bit faster and they might be a little more pass heavy. But then I look at this kid and he ran, he, he had 301 carries. That's nuts. Anyway, go ahead. You're up. Um, nine wins total or like nine wins in the regular season? Well, nine wins in the regular season. Then obviously you win the ACC championship game and the bowl game. So you get up to 11. Gotcha. No, I mean, nine and four, nine and three, nine and four, whatever. All right. If you get to nine wins, that is an appreciable step up. Um, it's something that, y- you know, that's that's tangible. It's not just, yeah, we think they're getting better. Well, they almost doubled their win total in one season. But see, I would now, mortgage, the- I would mortgage some wins to beat Florida in the swamp. Sure, man, but don't no, don't do for the better. But for the better, you're not winning a championship next year. And I know it's a big deal. You don't want to go six and six with a win over Florida. If the other option is nine and three, I'm just when you're looking at when you're a when you're a high school kid, when you're a high school parent, and you're trying to figure out if this place is on the way up, man, that record is going to be what matters. And if if you go from five wins to nine wins, all of a sudden you're like, look what we're doing, look at what we're doing. In one year, we made that jump. So if you come here, not only is it a family, not only am, you know am I a fun guy to play for, we got music in the morning and all that stuff, but you're going to win a lot of games. I don't think a kid really cares that much. And I'm just looking for the better. I, yeah, I know you do. I'm just saying for the for the future of the program, I think it's a, a bigger deal to win nine games than it is to beat your rival in the eyes of the recruits you're trying to get. Um, I don't know. I, I will I say know this. You don't. Obviously, it, it will know. I don't know some of it, if it's going to be a number. And I know I think you probably agree with this, but when we're asked this question in the middle of January, the only way you can really answer it is by throwing a number out there. It's going to be a look thing. I mean, I remember somebody asked um, us uh, after the Virginia Tech game going to Sanford, like, how would you, you know, what do you want to see in the Sanford game? Like, what would be considered a success to you against Sanford? I remember I was, I think I said, I just want to see four drives where they just go nothing but tempo and score touchdowns. Uh, I don't I don't even know if they ever got really Did you see won. that? I don't remember. No, I don't think so. Right. But, I mean, it, it's going to be, I think, Kendall Bryles, it, it's – my way or the highway sort of stuff where it's he's going to run fast. He's going to find five linemen that can figure it out. He's going to find three wide receivers that can line up and figure it out and, a, and, a, and a, an H-back tight end guy like McKitty to, to, to figure it out. I think it's there's going to be no sort of bend on that. So if, if there's going to be three games 
like ACC games. Let's say they, they hang like 42 on NC State here. Let's say they go up to, to Boston College and, and hang, you know, 45 there. Like, to me, it's going to be those games where everything's clicking against a quality opponent. Like, I, I don't care if we hang 65 against, um, you know, Alabama State. I mean, they should. It's going to be, will there be those games that you think, okay, it's a three-year contract. If he actually stays here for 2021, um, like, can we see that become part of, like, the regular DNA? That's what it's going to be like. I think if he can give you three games, like three games where it from quarter one to quarter four, you're thinking to yourself, like, damn, they can't stop us by and large. The only thing that's stopping us right now is us dropping a pass or – uh, getting a bad penalty, but man, we were moving the ball at will. That's the kind of stuff that's going to spell success to me, at least offensively. Defensively, I don't know. I'm I'm still disgusted with the defense. We'll get there. Soon. So, and then uh, in 2016 at Baylor, uh, they averaged 281 yards a game passing and 242 yards a game rushing. So they had a thousand yard rusher, a 750 yard rusher, a 623 yard rusher, and then Seth Russell ran for 500 yards. They also had a kid with 87 catches for 1,200 yards, KD Cannon. I don't know if he's in the league, with 13 touchdowns. And another kid had 63 catches, Ishmael Zamora. So, man, they put up huge numbers. You know, and I, again, I think I think for Florida State fans, I really do. I think that's a that's a good thing to see a kid that uh, Bry, the, you know, Bryles has no problem throwing to KD Cannon 87 times. Kid had 87 catches. Tamori and Terry is better than whoever KD Cannon is. So yeah, well, you have to imagine that he's going to get maybe not 87 catches, but he will get 50 or 60, and he'll have a 1,000, 11, 1,300 yards and a bunch of touchdowns. Like I think that's a good sign that when you have a guy – that you know, again, it was something we talked about all year, and it really was – you sat with me in the box every time. It was maddening that they didn't throw to their best player more. It was crazy. Yeah. The only time they threw to him a lot was the Notre Dame game, and they were all like 11-yard outs and slants. I, it's just, it just kind of boggled the mind. I think Bryles will be more apt to say, you know what? They can't cover that dude, so let's throw it to him. So anyway, next question. I think the more you research as the show goes on, you'll the, the encouraging thing is that he's done it so many different places, and I don't think it's ever really looked the same or been the same mix. That's the, the good thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if... I don't know if he's ever had three rushers that have had at least 600 or more yards, but he's always had at least one guy that's that's racked up yards running the ball. Yeah, well, in 2015, which I guess was his first year doing it at Baylor, they had 2,000-yard rushers. Shock Linwood, which is one of the better names in college football history. Correct. They also had Corey Coleman. So they had two 1,000-yard rushers, and wait, they had one wait, other. Wait, wait, they wait. had Corey Coleman with 74 catches for 1,300 yards and 20 touchdowns. Corey on Coleman, top of a guy, on top of two thousand yard rushers. Wait, Corey Coleman ran for a thousand yards. He's no, a receiver. sorry, receivers. He had yeah. seventy four catches for thirteen hundred and sixty yards and twenty touchdowns. Yeah. In the rushing attack, had two one thousand yard rushers. KD Cannon that year had fifty catches for eight sixty eight. Another guy had thirty eight catches for seven fifty eight. So they make the bigger plays, I guess you could say. You know, they have I'm looking at it real quick, their top their three leading receivers in 2015. Now again, this was Seth Russell, who was a good quarterback thrown to him. Corey Coleman averaged fifteen point four yards per catch. Katie Cannon averaged seventeen yards per catch, and Jay Lee averaged nineteen point four yards per catch. And on top of that, you had four guys who rushed for over five hundred and fifty yards. I mean, they put up monster numbers. Well, here's the thing. They're going to get they the ran ball for a lot. 327 yards per game. Well, because they're getting the ball a lot because their defense is surrendering 40 points a game. But that's what he's pretty much walking Fair. into hey, now. Hey, you know what? So. I, I, I used to lament that kind of football, and I still kind of do. I to do. me, it's a little bit like uh, the NBA now where everybody shoots 53s a game. It's kind of hard to watch sometimes. But from what we've had to see the last two or three years, I am up for some 48 to 45 games. Yeah. I am ready for it. I want to see it. Yeah. I want it to be like 1983, Florida State all over again, where if that team was going to win, they had to beat you 51 to 50. Like, that's what I'm ready to see, man. I'm all right with that. Give me some 48-45s. The Sunshine Pump. This is a, a troll account that basically has gone around this week. I don't know if he's still around. Maybe he's been banned or anything. Yeah, I think he might have gotten zapped. Um, but basically, he was a short-lived parody account on the boards. Where he just went around and saying that everything was great. 
Uh, he said, boy, this is the greatest podcast of all time. I wake up every morning thinking, isn't life grand? And then Corey and Aslan's voices bring about a big smile across my face. This is the kind of podcast you can build a Division One football program around. When FSU wins a national championship in 2019, it'll be in large part because of this podcast. Go Knowles. I mean, I, I don't know how you could dispute that. That didn't seem, uh, that wasn't tongue-in-cheek at all, was it? That's probably genuine. I guess actually not. Maybe not, yeah. All right. FSU guy 1989. Sup, guys. Hope you're both doing well and keeping busy. Uh, with us bringing on another former Noel to join the staff, Ron Dugans. I wonder how you guys would build the perfect FSU staff using only former players. Would you bring in Dion as a DB coach? Make T-Buck the DC? Does Jameis make it on staff? I personally would make Greg Reed the strength, or rather the special teams coach. I can't wait go. to hear what you have to say. That's a really huh. good question that we could use in probably June, uh, but it's January, so let's just go ahead and do it anyways because he asked now. All right. Um, so, yeah, quarterbacks, I would go with either – Brad um, Johnson. I, who? Brad Johnson would be my quarterback. Are we just basing it all on, on just how good of a player they were or just – like? Yeah, I mean, didn't he say Deion Sanders is one of them? He's never coached. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think no, I don't think it's about just what kind of player they are. I okay. think it's about how they might be able to relate to other other kids. So I was going to say either Ponder or EJ Manuel. Okay, because I do think although they did not play well in the NFL, they were good enough college quarterbacks for sure. Um, and they they you, they can read a defense, they can scout. You know, they they learn from Jimbo. It's a good guy to have. It's a good tree to be on, right? Right, right. So I, I think that those two guys, one of them would be a good QB coach. I'll say EJ. Um. I think, you know, I, I think EJ's uh, maybe a little cooler, um, maybe can relate to the kids a little more on the recruiting trail. Plus, Christian's married, has a, has a uh, you know, beautiful daughter, beautiful wife. So he probably doesn't want to recruit that much. Um, so I'd say I'd say EJ Manuel is my QB coach. Winky. T-Buck is my DB coach for sure. Okay. I don't know, though. See, Greg Reed would be nice as the, as the special teams coach. But I think you get he's basically a, a poor man's Terrell Buckley, in my opinion, as a punt whoa, returner. Whoa, whoa. Which is, I don't, that, that, not even a poor man's, a wealthy man's Terrell. I don't know. Uh, he, he, he and Terrell Buckley are both awesome, were awesome college punt returners. Poor man's was too much of a negative. But you're getting that out of Terrell Buckley anyway. So you save a little money and you make him his, the DB coach and special teams coach. He can do both. Um, offensive line coach. Walter Jones, can Brian he teach Stork. That? He's actually Who? coaching. Like yeah. Chris Winkie would be your quarterbacks coach. He's actually coach quarterbacks. Brian Stork is like a GA right now on the O line. You make Stork your O line. I mean, the question really is like, who's your OC? Who's your head? Like, is is Warwick Dunn your head coach or is Jameis your head coach? Like, do you want Jameis? Mild... I don't ahead. think Jameis is my head coach. Uh, Edgar Bennett coached for a long time. He's a um, running backs coach in the NFL. He get OC. Yeah, man, that's that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I, that's a hard one. We'd have to sit there and like really think about it. That's too hard to be to to be sprung on us like that. Okay, I'm saying my head coach would be Jameis. Just I think he he just he's got the right disposition. I want my OC uh, will probably be Edgar Bennett. Then I'll have uh, Winky as my quarterbacks coach. My receivers coach would be Ron Dugans. Uh, running backs coach, uh, Warwick Dunn. I got love for you, though, Warwick. I think you could have been the head coach for me, but uh, if James doesn't no, he could work be head out, coach I'll promote you. Excuse me? He could be head coach in waiting. Okay, perfect. Uh, defensively, uh, is, is who's there, your O-line coach? My O-line coach is going to be Brian Stork. Uh, I mean, good luck recruiting, man. What what is who's who's got the like who's who's off who's Alabama's offensive line coach? They keep recruiting well all the time, man. Build a good brand, get players at the next level. That's all I care about. This whole they can relate to them. Um, so you want you want to you want to keep going on the off the tricket tree. One guy's not bad. He won a national title and he won in the Super Bowl. I mean, come no, on, Stork he's got a was Super a very Bowl good ring. lineman, but I you know I've talked to him. I don't know. Maybe he's rising up the coaching ranks. Maybe he's perfect for an O line coach. He's a surly dude that I don't know how well he can communicate with 19 and 20 year olds, even though he's only 26, um, 27. He, you know, I, you know, I just, I, I would, I would, I would, uh, you know what? I'm going to stick with Greg Fry. I'm going to ride and die with Fry. All right. 
Okay. For once, I'm probably the more popular guy on the show right now. Uh, defensively, <laughs> uh, I, I guess D. Brooks will be my, my defensive coordinator. Um, I'll have Peter Bolware coach. Actually, no, Odell gets a whole defensive line. You got to start earning your keep, Odell. Can't have the specialization they make. Old, old D line's yours. Uh, linebackers, Marvin Jones. I think Marvin, um, he's actually he's got some head, uh, some coaching experience. Uh, I think he'll, he'll do good with the uh, with the linebackers. And then Dion and uh, T Buck can be uh, safeties and cornerbacks coach. They'll they'll figure it out. And then for special teams, uh, Tameric Vanover can come. He, he can be my my lone token sort of uh, ceremonial guy um, to to come back. You know, just because I would switch out. Ahead. Uh, that's all fine. You know, it's, it's way, there's just too much to even think about with this question, but I would switch out just for the sake of yours, Peter Warwick and Tameric Vanover. Peter Warwick really likes Taggart has a relationship with him. You could tell wants to be a part of the program in a big way. Let him be your special teams coach. If you, if you keep him and Dugan's on staff, but Willie Taggart's not the head coach in this because he's not a Florida state former player. Right. Who is the head coach? Winston. Winston. Corey, you're so intelligent and you're so learned when it comes to Florida State, and your answer to this has made me so upset that I'm going to the next question immediately. Bowden okay, Law, good. good morning, fellas. I'm from Live Oak, Florida, the same town as the Fryer brothers, uh, the only brothers to captain two separate FSU national championship teams, as well as Kyler Hall and Bill Reagans. Or is it Raggins? Raggins. Sorry. Reagans. Reagans. Yeah. Reagans. All right, I was right first time. My question, how do you all feel about the direction of the FSU defense moving forward? I'm certainly not an expert, but I'm worried about their ability to be multiple. Louisville game comes to mind as there were many coverage busts. Is it as simple as needing better players? Well, it's no. certain levels, I think. No, it is. I mean, you, you do need better players, and you could certainly use guys up front that can get to a quarterback. That makes everything look better. But no, I, you know, you, you're right. Louisville's a perfect example. Like, they should have probably given up 40 something points in that game, and Louisville was terrible. They just had way too many coverage busts. They, they, whatever was happening with the with the coaching, with the teaching, with the um, absorbing from the player standpoint, what's being taught, it wasn't getting through. There were coverage busts everywhere. You know, some of the stuff against Clemson, you know, the big plays they gave up later in the season, a lot of it was just getting beat by good players. Are your are your players not being good enough? But that's not an excuse for everything. There's just there were way too many coverage busts. Uh, to blame it just on the players. The, the, nobody on that side of the ball did well. For, for coaching our our players, I guess I should say. So I don't think, yeah, I'm obviously getting better players would help immensely, but I don't want to just give Barnett and that staff um, a free pass for what we saw in 2018. Yeah, Boy, you sure hope they bring in a, a defensive backs coach and hopefully a guy like uh, Buckley, who has cornerback experience, as opposed to McGriff, who's more of a safeties guy, because... And the problem was that, it, and I know, I guess maybe it just won't repeat itself. Like, you can't base your defensive success, you know, on being a, a team that creates turnovers because that's not like a – you can't replicate that. It's just it's kind of one of those weird things that happens. But the fact that they just kept constantly getting beat in coverage, like they had no idea how to play with their back to the ball on an island with somebody, like that's concerning. And that was something that he kept getting asked every single week. That we would talk to Harlan Barnett, and he's like, well, you know, we got when you, you're in phase or you're out of phase, you have to play through their hands. It's a pretty simple concept that, for whatever reason, never took. Um, so maybe they need well, some. Well, look, some of that is on the players, obviously. But also, you're allowed to teach some sort of zone principles where you're not just putting your guys on an island all the time against awesome players, especially when they keep proving to you they can't do it. You know, you'd like, yeah, multiple is a, a, a great word for it. You'd like to be able to, to see them, um, you know, confuse an offense. How about that? Yeah. The defenses are allowed to do that, and you really didn't see a whole lot of that in 2018. Yeah. I'd like to see some more blitzes. I feel like they did blitz early in the season, and they would get home, but then that slowly went away. But, again, the schedule got a lot tougher as the year went on as well. Next question. Bain Knoll 7. Good morning. I live in Atlanta, but I'm originally from Bainbridge, Georgia. I guess you could say Kirby Smart is the famous guy from our town. Weird mm -hmm. to say that since I grew up next door to him. Outside of that, oh. there's a river and a lot of gnats. My question is, why the hate for Francois? Not saying I favor him over Blackman, but I keep hearing you guys talk about his leadership without any examples. I know he didn't show up to a game in 2017 and a couple issues during last year's offseason, but what has he done since then? Is it more perception or actual specific things he's done or said? 
Just for the record, I don't care which one starts next year as long as the best one wins. I'll trust the coaches with that decision. Well, then why even ask us? If you want the coaches that you trust the coaches, hey, they'll hey, announce it in August. It's a very next polite question. question. No, I'm kidding. Um, and he's a fellow Georgia, fellow Georgia kid. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, I'm kidding. Nothing but love. Um, you know, there's other things. Um, again, it's not just uh, we would never judge anyone just how they treat the media. There were some I, I do remember before last season, he, uh, you know, again, uh, you may, uh, social media, is social media, but he knows what he's doing. And he re- he would retweet things that he shouldn't retweet about, uh, you know, maybe a fan saying who they think should be the starting quarterback. And he read, you know, he would retweet it. Like, even though James Blackman is playing at the time, um, he did not seem, at least from my vantage point, overly engaged in the uh, in the NC State game when he was not playing. If you're just talking about being a teammate, um, I don't know how many real good friends he has on the team. But again, I, you know, Chris Winkie wasn't beloved by his teammates. That dude wasn't hanging out with those with, with the receivers on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, but they did respect him. I assume his teammates respect him, but I don't know. Um, but it, it also goes back to, uh, you, you know, the Syracuse game where, uh, admittedly, Jawan Williams kept having to bend over to pick him up off the ground. And exactly finally, Francois had, had enough. Yeah. But, it, you know, he was screaming. He did, a, he did like a, a, a toddler reaction to being upset in the middle of a football field, in the middle of a football game on national television. Completely embarrassing his offensive lineman. But again, I, I understand the other point is like, well, if you get hit 12 times in a row, you do get mad. And sometimes you do want to hold the other teammates accountable. But either way, it's just it's that kind of stuff. And it's also stuff that I would never discuss on the radio that maybe you've heard um, our podcast. We're not on the radio right now that uh, you've heard some other stories that 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 just don't paint him as the best teammate. But again, I don't necessarily think he's a bad person but and it's also juxtaposed right aslan to to how good a teammate the other guy seems to be correct Um, right you know it's i I love when people say like i know he didn't show up to a game in 2017 and he had some stuff that happened in the offseason but what else has happened that's a big deal like when you're in the midst of the worst season in the in the school's history almost or not really the history but you know the worst season in you know three plus decades in 2017 and then your you know, preseason potential Heisman quarterback goes down and he's Snapchatting before, and, and you guys are fighting trying to get bowl eligible. That's going to piss you off for a while. And I mean, and I'm sure some people have gone over it, but as as many guys have gone over it, I'm sure there's a couple guys that probably remember stuff like that. Um, you know, I've I've been told a story that he's done some. He, he, there's been things that have happened when other kids have been on campus for recruiting visits that haven't necessarily ingratiated him uh, to recruits, and that's made recruits a little bit. Um, you know, somewhat maybe turned off uh, to come. Also, to remember State, the so. uh, the um, as soon as Willie took over, like at least he had missed a couple of team meetings. Right, right. You know, he, he's the, he's supposed to be the quarterback, the returning starting quarterback, and Willie called him out in an ESPN article saying he's got to become a better leader. We can't have him missing team meetings and showing up late to meetings and showing up not at all to practice. I mean, all that stuff that all comes with with being a you know being somebody that your teammates can count on. So it's a, it's a lot of stuff, but and, you know if he leads them to a nine and three record, throws for thirty four hundred yards, half of them going to Tamori and Terry, you know all will be forgiven. Yeah. Well, I mean, not all, but most. People change. I mean, I'm holding out hope. I mean, there's there is a there is a likelihood that he could stay, and if he's, I mean, he'll be that much more removed from that, you know, fairly gruesome. Uh, injury to his knee, so he, he very well could be a, a, a different looking quarterback just in terms of the way he can perform and move around, and that can um, allow all sorts of things to open up for him in the offense. So by by no means, it's just um, you just wish if he would figure it out. Just you know, let's figure this out. Who do you want to be, man? Like this is the last chapter of your legacy at Florida State. So either uh, get it right and, and leave no doubt, leave no more conjecture, no more. Um, you know, perception issues, man. Just go out there and get it done. It's just, it's hard to imagine it's going to change at this point, but it could. I'm just, I'm somewhat skeptical on it. But again, it could. But I'm and also, just real quick, um, so we know that it's not a completely media-driven narrative or a media-created uh, narrative. In his Instagram post about coming back for one more year, he admitted himself that he needed to be a better leader. He wanted to be a better leader than he had been. 
So again, it's not just us creating something that's not there because he's surly with us. Really, that has no bearing on anything. Um, he admitted it himself, and his head coach admitted it uh, 12 months ago when he took over. Okay. Uh, cat Chaser. But cat spelled uh, all caps, so it's probably an acronym for something. Anyhow. All right. So it's still what if Cat Chaser no. obviously you didn't explain your name in the ti- in the post. It's fine. If you leave if you leave another question next week, we, we you got to get to the bottom of that. You can't have a handle like Cat Chaser. That makes you wonder. Okay, are they like a zookeeper? Right. Do they go? Do they go catch you know you know cheetahs and bring them to zoos? What what's going on there? Maybe he goes to auctions and tries to buy lightly used heavy equipment, mainly Caterpillar <laughs> brand. Okay. All right. I see what you're doing. All right. Or maybe he loves cats. Or that. Guys, first time poster. Aslan, great to meet you and your brother after Christmas. Speaking of, it's actually my brother's birthday today. Um, Happy birthday, out, brother. Shout out to Big Bro. Um, love you, man. Uh, thanks for the shout out on your January 2nd podcast. I've been a long time lurker, but was not a subscriber until recently. I have enjoyed the podcast each morning. And after meeting Aslan, finally decided to subscribe. Awesome. Thanks, man. There Welcome. we go. Yeah. I mean, that's the guy I bumped into with my brother when I was back home for Christmas. Uh, he had the he had the old the old logo, the real logo. Uh, gotcha. Charm pendant on his on his neck, man. I liked it. Uh, our offense looked lost and unorganized ad nauseum last season. Now that our OC has been hired, I was wondering, in order to get everybody on the same page, how much teaching can Bryles do with his skilled players in the off season? Is it all classroom type teaching, or can they work on the practice field to work on pre snap formations? By the way, I'm originally from Long Island. Famous alumnus from my former school was Jumbo Elliott from the Jets and the Giants. Vince mm-hmm. Russo with the WWE and TNA and Matt Geiger, NBA center from my first high school. And then from my graduating high school is Aslan himself. Oh, there you yeah, go. Y'all went to right. the same East high school. Lake. Nice. East Lake represent. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. uh, I think a lot of it's it's player driven stuff in the offseason and it's strength coach sort of yes. let theoretically stuff. he can't have any yeah. contact with them other than the practices in the spring like right. he can't be out there on a practice field in uh february or june lining them up and showing them what to do now if he wanted to look out peer out his window you know uh you know we, we can allow that that's probably allowed maybe frowned upon but if he wants to just see what's going on or get a report on what's going on but also man in this day and age the iPad, the, the technology they have, all these kids have iPads, and I'm sure they're loaded up with what their position needs to be learning. Right. You know what I mean? I just I have to assume they are loaded up with it. I don't think – obviously, there's going to be hands-on teaching, and a lot of people learn much better by doing as opposed to looking. I was one of those people. Um, like, I, I just – I, I um, absorb it better when I actually do it. Uh, you know, when I when I learned to edit stuff or I learned to copy uh, edit or, you know, page design, I learned a lot more by doing it than somebody telling, OK, now you go to this tab. Now you go to that tab. I think a lot of kids are like that. So they're going to get a lot of it from the, the 15 practice in the spring. But they also are also getting a head start by I'm sure their iPads are loaded with with the terminology and what their what their certain jobs are on each each play call. Right. Correct. I mean, I'm sure he'll give them really specific instruction of what they need to do, what they need to know and learn after spring football is over so that they're ready once preseason camp opens up. I, so I wonder how much I want. I really do want to read the, the bylaw about coaches. I mean, I don't know if it's something broad and vague where, you know, coaches are not allowed to lead players in, in off season workouts or anything like that. But like, What's to stop them from just taking their their phone out and setting it up on a table and then, you know, like FaceTiming him and be like, all right. He's like, no, no, you're not lined up right. You move, you know, (laughs) I wonder if they can get anything around on that. But no, I mean, ultimately, like Corey said, it's it's limited in, in terms of the contact they can have with the players. But I think we just should be able to have confidence or optimism that, again, he he left Baylor and he went to FAU and they picked up right on the spot and, and kept rolling and he left FAU and went right to uh, Houston and, and they picked up and, and and started rolling and I know there's probably some some better personnel in terms of relation of the talent in those conferences. De'Eric King's a really good quarterback he had at Houston. Uh, the Driscoll kid at FAU uh, could do what he needed to do, but I mean he he's been able to to get this stuff running from the jump, so I I, I don't feel a lot of skepticism that he's going to 
fall into some sort of, oh, I wish I had more time with these kids because uh, he's had the same timeline. He's, he's been successful the last two years at uh, disparate stops. Next question. Word. Doak FSU1, good morning, guys. Do you believe that Buster Posey will be the next Florida State player to be inducted into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame? Also, can you think of any other Knowles that are in the MLB Hall of Fame, or rather the uh, – it's just the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's not the MLB Hall of Fame, right? Cooperstown's the National Baseball Hall of Fame, right? Yeah, but typically it's just for uh, pro baseball players. I, you know, I know they have the Pro Football Hall of Fame and the College Football Hall of Fame. I think it's just the – yeah, I guess it's just the Baseball Hall of Fame, but it's all almost all relegated to Major League Baseball players. Otherwise, J.D. Drew would be in there. Well, CFL guys are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, so there is that. Well, they're pros, though, right? Herschel Walker's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he didn't have a Hall of Fame career in the NFL, but when you throw his USFL stuff in there. Yeah. But I, I don't – so, but, yeah, I don't know. They should have a College Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm pretty sure they do. Oh, all right. Well, you don't know. All right, so let's look real quick. <laughs> he He's won three World Series. He's a four-time Silver Slugger, a six-time All-Star, an MVP, a Rookie of the Year, and a Gold Glove, and a batting title. Now, the thing with catchers is their numbers are never going to overwhelm you, especially him because he doesn't hit for power anymore. Part of that is because, you know, he's a catcher, and, you know, it's hard to hit for power as a catcher for a long time. Your body kind of wears down. And also he plays in a park that's like a cavern. So he's only got 133 home runs in his career, which isn't a lot. I mean, Jeff Francoeur had like 200, um, and Jeff Francoeur is nowhere close to a Hall of Famer. So his numbers when his career is over will not be will not wow you. But he was one of the best catchers in baseball for the better part of a decade now. And I think when it comes up, even though his numbers don't overwhelm you, I think because of the six-time All-Star, the four Silver Sluggers, he has a 300 career batting average, uh, 375 on base. Four, yeah, I, I can't imagine unless he really tails off um, these next two because he's only still, what is he, 32? He's 31. So he should still have four or five years left, and they're going to play him at first some. I think he's going to rack up 2,000 hits at least and be a seven, eight-time all-star at that position, a three-time champion, a MVP, a rookie. Yeah, I think he's a Hall of Famer. You know, the, he's not going to be. He's not going to be Mariano. He's not going to be unanimous. But I think Buster Posey's uh, um, done enough to get in. Yeah, I tried to find if there's anybody else with Florida State ties. I don't know if Larusa is in. I don't think Larusa is in there. Um, oh, he's not. He's got to be. Bobby Cox is in. I wonder if it's because he's still managed. It, it, maybe he's uh he just man he managed too recently to get in. I guess. But uh, yeah, he's got to be a Hall that, of, well, a be a Hall of, of him Famer. In a uh, Hall of Fame jersey, posing for a photo. Uh, yeah, he was inducted in 2014. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. you got that guy. You'll have Buster. Um, after that, man, it's hard. It's it's hard to get into that thing. Uh, Fred McGriff was one of the best baseball best hitters I've ever seen. That guy can't get in. Yeah. So it's it's hard to get in there. But yeah, I do think Buster will get in. And again, I hope they take into account that catchers other than Mike Piazza. They just do not, and that was a steroid era, by the way. They just do not put up big numbers. It's just hard. Brian McCann just, you know, he was a six or seven time All Star. The bodies just wear down too much. Yeah. Uh, Bimini Bound. Uh, he's got the uh, that photo with all those fish, and he he got him from the Dry Tortugas. So he's uh, updated us here uh, with a story. If anybody's worried, this ends up being Florida State football related. According all to right, the internet, the Dry Tortugas were named by Ponce de Leon after he slaughtered nearly two hundred sea turtles. Uh, hmm. The OGs would hunt them with harpoons and gaffs rather than fish for them by hook and line. I wouldn't recommend hunting or fishing for them because if you intentionally harm one of them, you will likely be locked up in federal prison. I have <laughs> accidentally snagged one by its shell, but it was released unharmed and I avoided hard time. On the topic of Terps, do you guys think that FSU should have bolted the ACC exit doors like Maryland did a few years back? <laughs> That's a good. That's a good segue. Well done. Uh, by the way, so Stephanie works for the uh, the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Water Department. She says that's like half her job is protecting the turtles. Yeah. Like people in this state love their turtles. We do, do not harm those things. We do. Um, yeah. No. Florida State is done. Florida State just needs to win football games, man. They're, the conference is taking care of them. Uh, Maryland. I mean, imagine being a Maryland fan. And who are your rivals now? Like you grew up hating Duke. And every time you beat Duke, it was awesome. It was what you lived for, those two games a year. And I'm talking about basketball, obviously. 
football, maybe not so much. But and then now, who? Oh man, we beat Indiana. We beat Nebraska, Iowa. Uh, yeah, even Michigan State. It's like okay, that's is that your rival now, Michigan State? You don't have any love for them. You don't have any ill will towards them. Just it was it was a bizarre. It was just a bizarre. The they that wasn't a. They weren't thinking it was. The athletic department in Maryland had, had made so many missteps that they were in such debt that they had to go chase down this offer um, to, for more money at the expense of what was better for their fans. Travel wise, ain't no ain't no Maryland fans going to Nebraska to watch a basketball game um, or a football game. But I bet they'd go to Chapel Hill or Virginia. Um, you know, just it, yeah, it was, a, it was. I'm glad Florida State did not do that. I remember being on Seminole headlines back when that was when the Big Twelve was talked about. And you know, me and Ira were were pretty against it going to the Big Twelve. Jeff was like, "Yeah, whatever, man." And I'm like, "Yeah, you say whatever, but are you going to go to Waco or Stillwater or Lawrence and watch these games?" And he's like, "Well, I don't care." I go, "Yeah, but other fans do. Florida State has a lot of fans on the Eastern Seaboard that want to go watch them play, and they're not going to Waco or Lubbock. Those places are, you know, I, I don't want to be rude." They're outposts. Very well said. They're outposts, and nobody would live there that doesn't have to. And you, you wouldn't want to. You certainly wouldn't want to travel there for a game. So I'm glad Florida State stayed in the ACC. They could just get more competent referees in football. Would be my 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 advice to John Swafford. Although uh, Joanne and Chip Gaines really have transformed Waco into an oasis out there in Texas, so it's it's worth looking into uh, going out to see Baylor play. Uh, sure. It's an unpopular sentiment here. I think, yeah, I wouldn't have liked Florida State to go to the Big 12 or the Big 10, but if the SEC had come ringing or whatever for some reason, it would be interesting. I'd, I'd like to see that alternate reality when if if they would have taken A&M and Florida State when they expanded back in 12 uh, as opposed to Missouri and Texas A&M because I'm pretty sure we'd have maybe an IPF already built um, just with a windfall from SEC Network money, but it didn't happen. And the ACC Network's getting off the uh, ground this year, and uh, the the dollars will start matriculating to us in Tallahassee soon enough. And uh, into us, probably. I'm not sure why we won't be a part. This show needs to be a part of uh, the ACC Network. Yeah. If headlines isn't, then this def- definitely needs to be. Yeah. All right, let's make this one the last one of the day. And. Um, I guess Thank we'll, heavens. Let's try not to get into the habit of doing this anymore, Corey. Let's really try to attack this with. Uh, well, I blame you. You, you, you also. You could also like. You don't have to read all of them, especially if they cover the same ground. Well, you, you don't just have to say, give five minute responses to all of them. Well, I know. Hey, I, I blame myself as well. Look, I don't want this to be our first fight, Aslan. I get it. I'm to blame too. You ask too many questions, and I'm too long winded. They're subscribers, We're going to have to figure though, that I mean, out in year two. They're subscribers. I have to take the questions from the subscribers. Sure. Well, yeah, you're right. And I took one from a non-subscriber earlier that really shut us, that really slowed us down. Yeah, exactly. All right. Last one for the day. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll do the rest of these for tomorrow as well as a recruiting chat with uh, Michael Langson. But here we go. Maxwell Gibbs. Nuck if you buck. Periods between all of them. It's Gibby coming to you from the East Village in New York City, although soon to be the Upper West Side once my fiance and I move into our soon-to-be hopeful new place. By the way, I, th- I, th- I thought the East Village is more uh, revered than being in the Upper West Side. We used to hang on the Upper West Side back in the day when we were younger bucks, but uh, I feel like everything's gone down towards the, the Lower East Side and the East Village. Anywho, uh, FSU sports too depressing these days, and look at me stalling and talking too much. Florida State, too depressing these days. I'm not about being depressed, gentlemen, so let's get creative here and let's be happy. Rank your top five favorite athletes of all time. Maxwell Gibbs, number five. Kobe Bryant, number four. Dan Marino, number three. Larry Chipper Jones, number two. Michael Jordan, and number one, Dwayne Wade. By the way, Corey, did you ever get Brady his shooting sleeve that you promised him? I did not. Um, I I meant to. He He has a sleeve that he got for baseball that he said he'd like to wear, but then he started playing so well. That I was like, dude, you really want to? You, you don't want to do that, man. You're playing well. You don't no need to no need to screw with something that's working. So he has gone sleeveless this year. Next year, I promised him when the season starts, he has earned it. Um, with the way he's played this year, he has earned himself a sleeve. I am not going to let him wear the leggings. Okay, that, thank you. That some people wear, like half the NBA now is wearing leggings. And one of my buddy's kids, uh, who's just you know a, a decent player, he's not anything great. He's like a 13 or 14 year old kid. He's wearing two leggings. 
And I was like, man, why do you do that? Like they're compression leggings. Yeah. I'm like, what's the story there? He goes, oh, they look cool. I'm like, all right, well, how about hitting a jump shot? <laughs> anyway, um, number five, I, I can't rank them. I can't I rank them. I can't either. Uh, that, that I would have liked to have some, uh, some maybe uh, some warning for this question. Dale Murphy, um, Dominique Wilkins, Chris Chandler. No, Chris Chandler. Yeah, um, Eugene Robinson. No, uh, so I would say Dominique, Dale Murphy. I guess I'd go Julio, and the reason for Julio is obviously he's a badass. He's one of the best receivers ever. But the catch he made in the Super Bowl was worthy. Of, I mean, that was an all-time great Atlanta sports moment. It won them the flipping game, and it was an incredible catch. And then, you know, that's something that Atlanta sports figures don't do. They don't come up clutch when it matters most. Chipper never went hit 600 in a, in a World Series with seven home runs. It just didn't happen. But Julio Jones, when it mattered most, went up and made the catch of his life to win them the Super Bowl, and they fiddled around and farted around and effed it up anyway. But I still, I'm always going to remember him fondly for that. So I'll throw him in there. And then I'll go to Chris Jackson, or some people might know him as Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Um, he played at basketball in the late 80s, early 90s for LSU, averaged 30 points a game, was just awesome to watch. He was Steph Curry before Steph Curry. And then uh, Dion. Dion? Dion or Buckley? Okay. I think you could tell when we were talking to Buckley that I knew a lot about him. Yeah. He was well, way up there as one of my – I I maybe – man, yeah, Dion was right there, though. So Dion and Buckley are, you know, 1 and 1A. Okay. So I have six. Those are my top six. You know, I used to really be into hockey, and, and like Mario Lemieux was my favorite athlete, but he doesn't have a lot of charisma, and I've learned to appreciate that more over the years. Um, the Joe Montana was my favorite football player growing up but he really wasn't all that charismatic either but I, I i still fight and die on that hill every january uh when the patriots make the super bowl that tom brady's not the goat uh joe montana is uh, joe montana didn't get to play the afc east every year exactly exactly uh montana uh magic johnson i don't think there's anybody in baseball that i've ever really been been enamored with i was a big glavin fan the great glavino uh, sure. Jameis is up there. Jameis is on there. Although, I mean, gosh, every Sunday watching him play with the Bucks just it, it erodes. It erodes. I also don't everything. think it should be. Uh, yeah, I get it. It should be somebody that's older than you. Yeah. Uh, I guess Julio's not older than me. So maybe I take him off the list and, and leave it with the other five. But somebody you grew up as a kid liking, not somebody that you liked when you were 30. Yeah, I'm a big Lakers fan. But like, I don't I don't like Shaq. I think Shaq's a jerk. Uh, Kobe Shaq is was like a, awesome. Kobe's like a sociopath. Yeah, Shaq was awesome, though. Shaq was I, – I don't get where Kobe all of a sudden becomes like one of the best players in the history, which he was. He is, yeah. but he was not better than Shaq. Dude, Shaq was incredible and unstoppable, and they played in three finals. They won three finals together. Kobe wasn't the finals MVP in any of them. The dude that averaged like 36 and 20 was. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, that's just me on my high horse. Kobe was awesome, but Shaq is the reason he won three of those titles. I did like Mike Singletary. Oh, geez, um, you're now you're just going on and on. What do you mean? I'm trying to name five: Montana, Magic Johnson, Jameis, Mike Singletary, and, and Mario Lemieux, Randy Moss. I love me some Randy Moss. Oh, all right. Well, that's good. He was fun to watch. Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Are we done? We're done. Uh. But we're going to have to come back tomorrow because we have all these paying subscribers that want their questions answered. All right. We'll do it for them. We love them. Sorry I took a non-paying subscribers question. That will not happen again. Lesson learned. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.